This is a video about a very familiar problem, the inclined plane, that you've seen a bunch of times. But what we're going to do here is we're actually going to solve the same problem using three different techniques that sort of sum up all the things that you've learned in mechanics. Uh, so let's do it. The first way to do it is with torques and forces. This is probably the way that you're most familiar with. And the strategy here is that you make free body and rigid body diagrams. So you make one for each object. We've got a free body for the block on the incline. We've got a free body for the hanging block. And we've got a rigid body diagram for the pulley. So here you have to draw where the forces act, not just what the forces are. So the purpose of these free body and rigid body diagrams is to write equations of motion. So this free body diagram generates equations of motion. Once we break it into components, it generates equations of motion in the parallel direction and the perpendicular direction. So if you haven't seen that done, you should probably go back and watch an easier video about inclined planes. But um, this is typically what you do. You break it up into the parallel and perpendicular components. The first free body diagram gives you that. The next free body diagram only has one direction to speak of. It gives you that. And then we've got uh, our rigid body diagram for torque. And this is the moment of inertia of a disc. Now, I didn't say in the problem that it was a disc, but whatever. If it wasn't a disc, we could put something else there instead. The point is you'll end up with some funny looking term that involves an M, a coefficient, and an R squared there. And instead of writing alpha, I've substituted in A over R. In other words, the tip of the pulley has to move at the same speed as the rope, which is the same speed as the blocks move. Um, if you take this and you grind through all the algebra, you get something that looks like this. You can work through it yourself or you can just take my word for it. I don't really care to do this doing a lot of algebra. And this is just to show you how to do it the different ways. Okay, so let's take that result. Let's park it up top. Let's do a different technique. Now we have energy. So is energy conserved here? No, definitely not. There's friction. But that doesn't mean we can't use energy to solve for the problem anyway. So let's see what that looks like. We want to write the energy initial plus the non-conservative work is energy final. So that means we've got a lot of terms to keep track of. We've got to keep track of the energy of this, the energy of this, and the energy of this. All the things that are moving in our diagram. The good news is that if I take all of the initial potential energies to be zero, in other words, I'll say this is H equals zero, and I'll say this is H equals zero. And you might say, wait a minute, those are at different heights. H how, how can you say that's H equals zero? This diagram doesn't have any labels on it. I could have just as easily drawn it with the block farther down. And the point is I can label it at any height I want because at the end of the day, it's really just a reference height for where the blocks are going to slide to. So in other words, I'm going to call both of these terms zero because it starts uh, at H equals zero. All of these terms also start as zero because the system begins at rest. So really what's left to figure out is how high does each block rise or fall and what is the corresponding change in motion as a result of that. So if I clean all this up, on the left, this is the work due to friction, the friction force times the distance it moves. This is the height that the block on the incline goes up. In other words, if this block goes down a distance x, this block slides up a distance x sine theta because this distance is x and this is theta and I'll leave it to you to work that out. Okay. If I plug in for the friction and I uh, rewrite a little more suggestively, then it looks something like this. So here's the friction. I put a minus sign because uh, force of friction points this way. The block is moving this way. So they're in opposite directions. So the cross product looks negative. Um, and then here again, I have plugged in I omega squared. And this V squared over R squared is omega squared. Okay, so let's just do a little algebra this time. I'll rearrange to make it a little more transparent. This is what conservation of energy, including the non-conservative forces, gives me. You might say, how am I supposed to get acceleration from this? You've got a V and an X. Well, I happen to know that the derivative of V is A, so let's just differentiate both sides. What does that look like? If I differentiate both sides, all of this is a constant. All of this is a constant. I don't have to worry about it. So the X just becomes a DX dt. And the V, I did a sneaky thing. Instead of differentiating just with respect to T, I first did D by DV, and then I paid for it with a DV DT. And that's that's chain rule, which you've learned from your calculus class. Okay, great. So you might say, okay, well, I don't see an A anywhere, but wait a minute, wait a minute. This is a V, and this is a V, and this is an A. So this V kills this V, and this one half kills this two. And if I do a little teensy bit more algebra, guess what? I get the exact same equation I got from doing it with torques and forces. Great. Let's park that. Next, 
angular momentum. This is probably the weirdest way to do it. It's, well, I should just say least familiar. There's nothing weird or bad about it. It's just you learn it later, so you're less comfortable with it. Let's write an expression for the angular momentum of all the things here. I've got two particles, and so the angular momentum for a particle looks like r sub i cross p sub i, okay? And then I've got one continuous or composite object that has i omega as its angular momentum. You might say, why do they have different formulas? They don't. This thing is the sum of all of its pieces, and if you were to sum up all of those pieces, you end up with a term that looks like the moment of inertia. So it really is the same formula for all of them. I'm just treating the pulley as someone has already done the sum on that for me, and I can express it as i omega, which is easier. So what does this look like? I've got a little uh, geometry drone here. The r means from the pivot, we're going to evaluate at the center of the pulley to the place where the momentum is. And so the relevant angle here is this angle. I'll call it phi. And this angle, I'll also call it phi. So what I need is cross product, the magnitude tells me rmv sine phi and rmv sine phi two. The relevant thing here is that this r times sine of phi two or r times sine of phi one, it's actually the same angle. So r is like the hypotenuse. And so r sine phi actually gives me this distance, which is just r, holy cow, what an easy way to rewrite all that. One thing to bear in mind is, hey, I've got vectors up here and I've got not vectors here. What did I do there? Well, I know that uh, the angular momentum has to be perpendicular to the plane of all the things. And the plane of this page so is in the plane of the page. And so uh, the angular momentum has to be perpendicular to it. And so I use right hand rule in order to understand that all of the torques, all sorry, all of the angular momentums point out. They're all out. Okay, so with that being said, I plug in my r m v and r m v okay and great that's my angular momentum well what do i do with that because that still hasn't told me the acceleration well what what is the relationship between angular momentum and torque oh boy so if i can figure out the external torques on this system and then i take a derivative like i did with energy maybe i can get an acceleration out of that you can see v's here so if i differentiate i'm going to end up with a's now the nice thing here is this says torque external I only need to worry about external torques on my system because even though I agree that these two ropes create torques on the pulley, they, as far as torques about this mass go, create counter torques on these blocks. And if I add them all up, they'll all disappear. So I only need to consider external torques. What are the external torques? Well, this has a net force on it due to gravity and friction. It also has a normal force and it also has a component of gravity that points in the opposite direction, but those cancel, so I actually don't need to worry about them when I add up all the forces. And this guy just has mg acting on it. In other words, I have far fewer things to worry about in this case because I only need to worry about uh, external torques. Now check this out. I'm doing, a, I'm doing a cross product here to find the torques and this angle, hey, guess what? It's the exact same angle I had before. So all of this business where I have to figure out the lever arm, and this is the lever arm, and it's very complicated, it just reduces to a big R in, in all cases for the same reason that when I did this, all that fancy stuff reduced to a big R. Okay, great, that's my torque. I'm going to set it equal to my rate of change of angular momentum, dl dt. So the, all I did was I just made the V and A, and guess what? A little bit of algebra, and boom, the exact same result. Now, since you've been such a good audience, I'm going to give you a bonus way. Notice we talked about all our big ideas except for momentum. The only reason I didn't lead off with momentum is because the momentum here is a little weird. Remember that momentum is a vector, so it needs to be conserved in each dimension. Angular momentum all pointed one way, so it wasn't a big deal. But in this case, look, this block is falling down. This block is moving in this direction and this direction. And the pulley, I don't know, the center of mass of the pulley isn't moving at all. So the reason I saved this for last is because it's the weirdest. So what we're going to do is we're going to unfold the system. I know that that looks really weird. I'll tell you what I did. I took the pulley and I just pretended I unwound it around and I laid everything out. I'm going to pretend that I just have a rope that's tugging to the left instead of down with MG. And it's tugging to the right like this. This pulley does contribute inertia to the system, but it actually ends up not mattering about the radius. 
Whatever that coefficient is in the mass of the pulley, it's as if it were just another block that's being pulled by these forces. Okay, so this is now the momentum of my system. They all have to move at the same rate because they're all connected together. Um, and if I take a derivative dp dt, that has to be equal to the sum of the external forces. The sum of the external forces is just this and this. So if I do that, guess what? I get the exact same formula all over again. So I just want to point out, look, energy isn't conserved in this problem. Angular momentum isn't conserved in this problem. Momentum isn't conserved in this problem. These are just calculational schemes. And that's the goal of mechanics. Introductory mechanics is to teach you about these different calculational schemes. And so if you understood all of the different calculation schemes in this demo, you understand introductory mechanics. There's a lot left to say. You can talk about oscillations and waves and all that. But that is just applications of these calculation schemes that you have just looked at. Okay, I hope this was uh, more helpful than confusing.